The Pursuit of Podcast, a purely guest-centric show focusing on people and organizations that advance positive change. Positivity can be anywhere, and in a time of vast discord, the pursuit of is finding those who champion its causes loudest. Join us as we sit and learn about the pursuits of local leaders in their community. Let's go. Hello, good people, and welcome to the Pursuit of Podcast, where it's truly not us, it's you. I'm Ryan Buck, Artist Development, New Leonard Media. With me, as always, is the boss, Mark Wilson, President, New Leonard Media. How are you? I'm doing real well. I got out, did some lawn work today. Did you? Yeah. That is That's enough great. about us. Holy cow. Our guest today is Jillian Manning, Executive Director for the National Writer Series here in Traverse City. How are you? I'm good. Thank you so much for having me, Ryan. Thank you for being here. This is a big deal. Nice, hot, warm day. Hopefully you feel cool in the studio. Yes. No, very comfortable. Yes. Excellent. And we <laughs> talked about your comfort with podcasts. I've seen you on TV. This should be a breeze. Yes. Well, I think you and I, we can chat all day yeah, if we want to. <laughs> that is true. So looking at the National Writer Series website, and this is right off the website, you're a nonprofit organization dedicated to engaging world-renowned authors in meaningful conversations in the Traverse City area. Your goal is to create a deeper understanding of issues and ways of life that exist within the outside of our rural boundaries. So, and that's just the start of it. So when you tell somebody what you do, is that part of your elevator pitch? Or what do you say when you say, I'm the executive director of the National Writers here? Yeah, it's it's an interesting combination of skills, right? So we at once are a event festival-based opportunity for people to connect with authors and and learn from them and hear their stories. We're also a group that wants to get literacy and creative writing happening in our community. And all of that is wrapped into having fun and just really connecting with Traverse City itself. So it's three hats. It's probably 15 hats between all of us, but it's a fabulous organization. Absolutely. So since inception uh, in 2010, correct? Yes. National Writers Series has hosted nearly 200 authors. Yeah. And many of great renown. And you mentioned hosting events, which is great. You've drawn tens of thousands of people over that time. But more importantly, you help facilitate the selling of some 18,000 books in bookstores. So right now, how healthy is the bookstore environment and where do you see that going? That's a great question. Yeah, COVID has has had some pros and cons. You know, there have been bookstores that have closed because of COVID, which breaks my heart. My background is in book publishing, so all I've ever wanted is to get books in hands everywhere I go. But at the same time, you know, Horizon Books is our core partner right here in Traverse City. And they were about to close, like right on the eve of COVID. And such community support poured out for them that they are still open, rocking and rolling and having a great time. And I think that the bookstore is a community center and the bookstore is a place of comfort and belonging and ideas and exchanges that you can't ever replace that. There's nothing else like that. And so for us to be able to support one bookstore, a thousand bookstores, whatever it is that we can do in the long term, that's yeah. fantastic for that us. That is such a great story. I, I remember reading that being, you know, and I'm, I'm such a fan as well. But when you look at the health of a, you know, of a bookstore, are they easier sustained in a small town versus big cities? Are you hearing anything about like what may be happening in that culture in Grand Rapids, for example? Yeah, yeah. I think, I mean, it really depends on the the community that you've built and things, I mean, as mundane as rent and square footage. I mean, at the end of the day, that's what you have to support. And that can be really tough if you're a huge store. But sometimes, you know, a place like Horizon, they have food and beverage. They have these community gathering spaces where the, like, I used to go to a writing club there with COVID. That hasn't been happening. You did but storytelling there. Exactly. Down the Cafe. Yeah. Yeah. It was awesome. yeah. Yeah. It's like where I bought my first book as a kid. You know, it, you build these layers you over time. You bought your first book there? I did. Yes. Oh, do you remember what it was? Oh, no. I, I, Wrinkle in Time is the first thing that pops into my head. Okay. I don't know if that's true, but could very well be. Yes. It's a good choice. Yes. So many know the story of an online company called Kadabra that ironically started selling books online uh, that became a little web company called Amazon that ironically almost put a lot of bookstores out of business. So how does the National Writer Series embrace the digital space while balancing your love for brick and mortar? Yeah, I mean, we obviously know that people are shopping at Amazon. We don't encourage it, though, honestly. You know, we say shop your local independent bookstore because, I mean, Amazon is great for so many things. I I have an Amazon account. I'll admit it. Um, (laughs) But I don't buy books there because, I mean, what Horizon and other bookstores in our community do is they bring authors here. They're employed by the people in your community. They put on story times. Amazon Mm -hmm. doesn't do that for you. Amazon can get you the weird 1920s hat that you need for your party that you're going to. It can get you the rake. Yeah, that you can't (laughs) find at Home Depot. It It can do things for you, and it's great for that. But 
for books, I mean, a bookstore, it's just there, there's nothing else that fills that gap the way it does. So we just we lean into that and we want that to last forever. Well said. So you graduated with a BA in English from the University of Michigan. Much to my uh, parents' fear, yes. <laughs> okay, and gained subsequent accreditation in publishing from both the University of Denver and Yale University. Yes, yes. So <laughs> what did that continuing education do for you, and how did you get into Yale? Traverse City really is what got me there. So I was interning at a company here in Traverse City, and it's called Jenkins Group, and they're fantastic. And we got reached out to by Yale University's publishing course, and they said, hey, do you want to send somebody to like cover this from like a media perspective? We had a, a small magazine we ran and, you know, just see what it's like. And this was for like mid-level senior publishers. And I was an intern. I was 20 years old. I couldn't even drink when I went. And <laughs> so I went for this. It's like a week and a half long course. And you go from like dawn to dusk every single day on every intense publishing. I mean, publishing isn't like doctors or anything like that, but we can be intense when we want to be. Sure. And Every, I was sort of like the little kid of the group, and they all took me under their wing, and I learned so much, made so many incredible contacts. The best story was there was a gentleman, I think he was in his 90s at the time, Martin Levin, and he told us this story. It was a whole piece about ups and downs in your career and how when you work a long time in any career, you're going to have these ups and downs. He said at one point, one of the publishing houses he was working with, and he was part of this team, got the opportunity to take on these James Bond books. The author had recently died, and they were like, well, nothing's really going to come of this. We're just going to pass before oh any of the movies were made. And that's a great example of it down, but you can cycle back up. And he had, of course, a million wonderful examples of things that they did, you oh know, right, goodness. and picked the right things. But can you imagine, in the back of your head, you're Ian like... Fleming, little yeah, legacy right I there. I know. Yeah. That's incredible. So th did that continuing education, was that pretty important? After regular college, did you find that that gave you a leg up or that gave you confidence? Oh, yeah. And the University of Denver, that publishing program, that they basically bring you in to train you to go into publishing because it's kind of an apprenticeship business. You know, you can be prepared for certain parts of it, but especially editing and you know, that art is so hard to actually get when you're in school and when right. you're young. So that program, that was how I got my first job out of the gate and how I went on from there. And so, yes, I would never say go get an MFA or a, a master's in publishing because you'll be paying that back for the rest of your life. But these programs were fantastic. And in, in publishing, you initially had this illusion of what a publisher looked like, which is to say a turtleneck wearing kind of coffee drinking New Yorker <laughs> with red pen smudges on your uh -huh. on their fingers. That's not true, right? No, I didn't actually own a turtleneck until, well, I think I had one as a kid, but I just bought my first one as an adult like this year. So I made it this far without a turtleneck. Congratulations. Yes. And I don't drink coffee still. So yeah, I, <laughs> I luckily managed to skirt a couple of things. And for me, I'm a Traverse City girl. And so I wanted to be in the Midwest. And New York was this big, scary city with big, giant skyscrapers. And I knew I couldn't hack it there. I was just, I would be, I'd be missing my water. I'd be missing my trees. Right. My heart wouldn't be there. And so luckily, there's amazing publishing houses in the Midwest, and I was able to stay close to home, just be on Lake right. Michigan all the time. That's the dream. <laughs> yeah. And your first, if I'm not mistaken, job was Sourcebooks. Yeah. And that's in Naperville, Illinois. Yes. Now, being from the northwest suburbs of Chicago, I know that is definitely not a teeny little apartment in New York. I, I know what Naperville looks like. Mm -hmm. But it was a startup. So how important was working for a startup publisher in your early career as opposed to coming into a giant behemoth? Yeah. What was so fantastic about the time that I joined Sourcebooks, so it's run by this woman, Dominique Raka, who is one of the most kick-butt women I've ever met in my whole life. She's just a visionary. And the company at that point was already 20 years old. She'd started it in her upstairs bedroom, but it was it was a startup still. And it to this day, it's run like a startup in the best possible way. So nimble just adaptive and smart and curious about trends and what's changing. And I learned so many things because you just had to have your finger in every single cookie jar along the way. You right. had to know how to do all of these things. And the team was so collaborative and fantastic. And if Naperville had been Traverse City, I'd still be there. Really? Yes. But Naperville was Naperville and Traverse City was still about six hours north. So I feel you. I really <laughs> do. So, you know, as you look at that, did that entrepreneurship, and, and I don't know from a large publishing company, do you think that pushed you in a certain trajectory? Did that give something to your spirit by going, that's the feel I want. I don't want this big Goliath corporation. Yeah, especially what I loved about it was that like Dom was there every day and you got to go into meetings at the CEO in her office and she knew everybody by name and she cared what everybody was doing. And I had always been in small offices, so I'd expected that. But when I came into, I was like, you know, this is still a, an actual big girl job. I was like, oh, I'm going to be this little fly on the wall. 
And she took the time to know everybody. And that type of leadership, I think, is fantastic. And to be a company now that it's grown exponentially since I've been there, and I would bet $100, $1,000, million dollars that she still knows everybody's name. Right. That sets the bar pretty high for a leader. Yeah. So for you, when you go into a new opportunity. Mm -hmm. And speaking of that, in order to get back to Traverse City, this moved you into the world of public relations. Yes. So as you look at that transition, because, you know, they're not necessarily parallel. Was that a scary jump for you? Did you feel really well prepared when you got your first PR role? Oh, I didn't feel prepared at all. I, uh, (laughs) no, no. So I didn't say that in the interview, did you? I know I did. I think I I told my my boss I was, I, I had never even taken a marketing class, guys. You know, before my interview, I bought a whole bunch of books about how to do PR because, you know, the book girl can learn from books. And I read them and highlighted them and took this giant, you know, notebook full of notes and at the end of the day, it's storytelling, right? You know, there are definitely hard skills you have to learn, but the soft skill is storytelling. And I'm like, okay, that I can translate. But yes, I remember being shocked I got an interview, being shocked that I got hired. I know I'm a competent person and I I work hard, but having no background, nothing to pull from. But then what I wound up with was a fantastic boss who invested in me to get better at that set of skills. And Again, these fantastic leaders, I am so blessed to have had Did you go into that interview holding that previous leader standard to that potential new boss? Were you looking at at it through those glasses going- Oh, absolutely. Did you get those vibes right away or did you have to kind of settle into it a few weeks ago? I think this person- Luckily, in our interview, he was very professional and kind and polite. And I had been offered the job and was in the process of moving and hadn't yet started, but stopped in at the office- And my boss was known for these amazing high fives and gave me a high five that left my hand red and ringing for, you know, the next three hours. And I was like, that I like, like there's this enthusiasm and this energy, but I also know there's this professional side. And I was like, that's a, that's a full person. And I think if you can be your full self at work, that means you can lead well, as long as your full person is like a good person. I love the term full person. Yeah. And later in your career, you'd work with another person who gave aggressive high fives as well. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. My well, whole so, life. So you're, you're ready for I'm, it. Yes. Aggressive high fives everywhere I go. you feel anything in your hands go. at all at this no, point? No, 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 no. You're I, okay? Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Looking at the National Writer Series, the one thing I think a lot of people would like to know, specifically me, is how do you get writers here? You know, because I'm sure they're pulled, you know, whatever level they're at, you know, in every direction, whether they have a publicist or an agent or not, how do you do this? Yeah. So a two-pronged, and I'll start with the story of what it used to be like. So this is anecdotal as I wasn't there for it, but- We apparently used to print out a map of Michigan and draw a star where Traverse City was because 10, 12 years ago, (laughs) nobody even knew where that was. We didn't have direct flights. We didn't have any of this to pull us here. So we'd be like, it's this place. We'd send some pictures of, you know, the lake and the bay and be like, really, you do want to come here. And they'd get here. They'd be amazed. (laughs) But the two main ways, you know, that we get people, most of it is these authors go on book tours to promote their new book. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times it was just on the coasts, right? You know, because you can get high population, lots of great bookstores. And middle of the country, other than maybe Chicago, was often left out. And what the Writer Series did is we made it more than just a book reading. This is a book event. And what's fabulous about Traverse City is that it's a book town. And so people turned out. They don't want to just hear about the book. They want to hear about your life. They want to hear about how you do your writing. They want to hear about what weird thoughts wake you up in the middle of the night and spurn that next book idea. So when somebody's on tour like that, you get in touch with their publicist and you make the case for why you're the best place for them to go. Because these are, you know, the publisher's dollars. And why are you spending them the best with us? Well, because we've got a bookstore like Horizon, right? Where we can sell lots and lots of books. We have this amazing community of people who really care and are going to show up in the hundreds. Because on the publishing side, I've been to bookstore events where 10 people show up. Right. And, you know, it's it's tough. And it's hard to get attention. There's so much happening right now. So luckily, they built a fantastic model that gave both the audience and the book sales and was in this beautiful place. And then the second way is we just find those amazing people and we were like, we will give you a small amount of money because we're a nonprofit, but as much money as we can possibly (laughs) scrounge up together to come and talk to us. And so that's a little bit rarer, but does happen. Right. So you're doing a lot of legwork. You're doing a lot of selling in a way. Yeah. How many no's do you get before you get a yes? That's a great question. At this point, I mean, I can imagine in the early days it was it was more no's as you were getting started. But for me now, it, people actually come to us, you know, they have heard the reputation of what we do is been so wonderful. And other authors talk about the fun stop in TC. Right. Because there has to be that circle, especially if they're in the kind of struggling the mid tier with a little success. Mm-hmm. Hey, you got to check that out because yeah. it was good for me. Yeah. That's amazing. In, in your mission talks about what I love about what you do, raising writers. Yeah. 
and you have, it's amazing, you have actual programs. So when you look at your lineup, it's not just about the huge names, right? Oh, yeah. No. When I approach, you know, setting up a season, I'm looking for three things. Like, I need to have some big headliners. Like, for our fall season, Anthony Doerr, All the Light We Cannot See. He was a Pulitzer Prize winner for that, on the bestseller list for something like 200 weeks. I don't even know how many years that is. It's a pretty uh, good run. It's a lot. It's a long time. <laughs> so, like, you know, you know people are going to show up for that. And then I look to see, how are we going to engage younger people? Because... You know, do kids necessarily see themselves like going to the city opera house for an event? You know, no, that's more of an adult thing. But I want to bring them in and have these conversations and let them see writers and see cool writers. You know, I I remember I was always the nerd that loved reading and writing in school. But I know there's always that time where it's like, oh, you're reading a book. That's not cool. And I'm like, let's stamp that out. I don't want that anymore. So that's bringing in somebody like Jason Reynolds, who is probably the coolest person I've ever met in real life and is just this fantastic writer and can really relate to everybody. And then my third piece is like, what's the conversation that we're missing in this community? Like, what have we not talked about? Or what what are we talking about a lot and we haven't gotten this perspective on? You know, this was from one of our previous seasons, but we brought in a woman, Carla um, Villavicencio, and she was an undocumented American who graduated from Harvard and had this just fantastic story and had this went around the country talking to other undocumented immigrants about what the experience is like in this country. And nobody else had done that. And in Traverse City, we sometimes don't think about that and what that's like. And so having a voice come here and actually open our eyes to that is fantastic. And when you look at, and I may be speaking out of turn here, but when you look at authors, it doesn't just have to be novelists, right? There are people who write cookbooks or poetry. Do do you look to include some of the more, I guess, non-traditional writers? Oh, yeah. Yeah. We've had screenwriters come in. We had the folks from Mad Men come in. And do stuff we had Breaking That's Bad. Awesome. Um, yeah. yeah, Breaking Bad. Yeah, and the Curse of Oak Island. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He was on stage, and somebody had written a book about you know writing is an art form, and whatever way you're doing it, you know, n- normally it's a pretty good mix between nonfiction and fiction, and then we throw in a couple of surprises in there as well. You do a great job. Oh, you thank really you. Do. It's it's exciting. Looking forward to uh, the Firekeeper's Daughter. Oh my gosh, yes, that book is one of my favorite books of the year. And when I was able to touch base with Angeline and say, hey, would you want to come? She, oh, that's a fangirl moment for me. I try not to fangirl. I try to be professional and be cool about it. And I was like, I think on the phone, like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. She's like, okay. It's extraordinary. (laughs) One of the many, many things I admire about National Writer Series is its commitment to including and teaching children and youth. Yeah. You touched on that a little bit and and it's engaging them. And I know it's a passion of yours. Can you speak to the Genesis of that. I know the founder, um, Ann Stanton, that was an early passion of hers. You know, where is that going? Where are you at now and where is that going? Yeah. So we're actually this fall starting uh, sort of a new branch. So COVID was a weird time because we couldn't be in the classroom with kids. And that was that was hard for us. But we also learned something. We learned that we can reach way more people and we can engage them in different ways. Programs that historically had, you know, five to 10 kids participating. When we went virtual, we could get like 100 kids participating. Even our battle of the books where we have these fourth and fifth graders come together, they read like a stack of 10 books, and then they battle it out trivia style. We had a record-breaking year on Zoom because it was just more accessible. And so while we definitely want to go back to in-person things, we're also going to have this mix of virtual stuff. And one of the coolest things we're going to do is have our author visits, which were traditionally just brought into one classroom for one day, go virtual or go to a place like the library where as many people as we can fit in a room can come. And these kids will actually get to ask questions and interact with these authors. And that was, I couldn't even imagine that when I was a kid. Like yeah. I would have fainted and fallen over on the ground and probably been out for the whole thing, but it would have been great. <laughs> Shout out to our, in, in your local library. Oh if my you gosh. can support your Cattle. local library, yes. especially ours, I think it's extraordinary. In looking at youth initiatives, you have programs, and I know you've specifically taught classes like this, teaching children how to write a children's book. Yeah. Which must be interesting because, you know, most writers... You know, they write what they know or what they can imagine. And when I was a kid, I remember reading children's books and the pictures were just pencil or maybe a painting. Mm -hmm. Now with computers, the illustrations are so much more. How important are the words versus the illustrations to a children's book? Yeah, well... I, I'll give you two examples. One is is B.J. Novak, the book with no pictures. Yep. Yep. Um, the other, oh, I'm going to forget the author If people right don't now. know who B.J. Novak is, you can look him up. He was an actor on The Office, probably best yes. known. <laughs> and a great children's author. Yeah. There's a, there's a book called Journey that has no words at all, just pictures. And there's a book called Ball 
that is just the word ball. And it's about a dog and a girl and it's just ball, ball in all these different contexts. What does and, that retail for? Uh, <laughs> like you should just go pick it up right now. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, I think to me, you know, as somebody who's a terrible stick drawing type of artist, like <laughs> words matter a lot. But at the same time, I mean, when you are an artist of any sort of caliber like that, you can tell a whole story without a single word. And it's amazing. And it, different kids want to come in at different places. And that's why I feel like the rise of graphic novels has been so big is people for a long time were like, that's not reading. Of course that's reading. Right. And to open that up and make that genre both accessible and acceptable has been huge in getting kids engaged in reading again. A gra- and I've heard that counterpoint myself is that a graphic novel isn't technically reading, but I found that it can be a gateway. Oh, totally. It can at least get your child into reading and then you move them into chapter books. Yeah. At age two, a child's brain is as active as an adult's. By age three... Their brain is more than twice as active as I adults. believe that. <laughs> and that reading aloud early and engaging in literacy pursuits as early as possible is critical for development. Would you agree with oh that my at gosh. that age? Oh, absolutely. And I think that's when your love of reading is formed. You know, I think if you grow up in a reading household, that's going to put you on a path. I mean, there have been studies done about, you know, if you're reading well and reading at your grade level, how much farther you can go in your school and your career. Right. And those things, again, sometimes are dismissed as soft skills, but they're so huge. If you can communicate and connect in life, what else matters, honestly? You can do anything with that. Right. I've, I've read that students who choose what they read and have a more informal environment in which to read, they tend to be more motivated. Yeah. And they show kind of greater language and, and literacy development. Do you have resources? Does the National Writers Series have resources for parents who may be struggling or any ways, because I just can't create that environment. Can you help if somebody calls and says, what can I do? Yeah, no, that's actually something that we're working on for future years, because we've been we've been so long really thinking about creative writing and building that skill versus literacy itself. You know, for our youngest, you know, fourth and fifth graders, we work there. But what you're talking about starts well before that, you know, that's like, that's first grade, second grade, when you're really learning those key skills. And it's something that, you know, there are a lot of great people in this region that are working on that, that I want to partner with and build. Yeah. That's incredible. Because I I can see needing help. And, you know, sometimes you might not have the time, but if you have just not a trick, but something that can guide you into creating that environment, or maybe someday you just notice that your child is reading and you just let them be. Yes, exactly. Yes. Shower them with a little candy. It doesn't (laughs) matter if you've read the same book five times in a row. Mm -hmm. It's okay. I have a couple of stats for you. um, and, And it leads to a relevant question. But at present, or as of an article in 2020, one-third of fourth graders reach the proficient reading level. One in four children in America grow up without learning to read. One in six children who are not reading proficiently in the third grade does not graduate from high school on time or at all. 85% of juvenile offenders have problems reading. And three out of five people in American prisons can't read. So as I was looking into this, I think what you are doing, and this is just a shameful accolade for you, is helping because there are so many statistics that link poor reading skills and literacy skills to problems later on, including prison. And a lot of it is linked to access, Mm -hmm. access to books. Mm -hmm. So do we have an issue with that in Traverse City? Have you heard of it in other areas of access and more impoverished areas. Is that something that comes onto your radar? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, Two of the schools we actually work with, uh, Traverse Heights and Blair, we do poetry workshops there. And those are places where kids are like at something like 90 plus percent are on the free school lunch program. Mm -hmm. And to be able to express yourself creatively when you're in a situation where home life might be good or bad, but there are these challenges that are happening that you can't control, and especially at that age, but to give them the skills to both know that their opinion and their thoughts and their voice matters and then that they can express it in a way that is powerful and meaningful. Honestly, it's my favorite program that we do. It gives me chills like thinking about it right now. (laughs) Um, But yeah, I mean, I think one of the things we're doing with Front Street Writers this year, which is our part of our Raising Writers program, is we worked really hard to get a whole bunch of grants and donations and fundraising done so that all of our programs could be offered for free. Every single Raising Writers program we have this year is going to be free. And we're going to get laptops and hotspots that we can give out for kids that don't have either good access or reliable internet access. Part of the reason of doing things virtually is that there are kids that can't get the transportation in and out of Traverse City itself if they're coming from one of the kind of outlying counties. And that, I think, access makes the entire difference. I mean, if you know that you can do this and you can connect with this and it, it isn't 
a huge burden on your family or being told you can't do it for these reasons, if you can just do it and there's nothing standing in your way, what other doors does that open? Right. You know? And sometimes it's not just access. It may be transportation. It may yeah. be. So are there ways that people who have transportation challenges can get access to literature and to reading? Yeah. So, I mean, the local libraries, I think, in the sort of surrounding counties have been doing such an amazing job with outreach. And even Grand Traverse County, our, our Traverse Area District Library, they are putting... I'm not remembering the cool name of, I think it's the bookmobile, but they are literally, they've got a van, they're tricking out a van and it they're going to, the bookmobile. yeah, fill it with books and take it all around to places where it's a little bit harder to get to and from the library and get books in the hands of people. So they're getting creative and they're reaching out in ways that you would never expect them to do. And it's, it's so inspiring. That's amazing. You talked a little bit about one of the Raising Writers programs. Are there any other programs regarding Raising Writers that you can share a little bit about? Yeah. So so Battle of the Books is is part of that. And that's the very fun trivia contest, which I totally, I would have been so into that as a kid. I would have like been studying all night long. Is so this I knew. something that a parent could like ape from you for their kid's birthday party? Oh, probably. They yes. wanted to do yes. a really <laughs> cerebral. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Give Give them a book and yeah, all the kids get a book. Yeah, exactly. Who needs clowns anymore if you can have a book trivia contest? So that's huge. I mean, that's that's 350 kids that participate in that program from mostly Grand Traverse County, but also kind of some of the outlying counties. And then we have the poetry workshops that I talked about. And then our Front Street Writers program is really what we're expanding. So it's going to have these three kind of, we're calling them pillars, so to speak. One is a creative writing intensive where it's a semester long course. This is for like the Jillian style nerds <laughs> that want to dive into fiction, creative nonfiction and poetry. And we've got this amazing instructor and we're going to be bringing in these writers from all over the state and the country to talk with this cohort of kids, sort of like a master's of fine arts, learning this craft. And at the end of the program, they get published in our National Writer Series Literary Journal. So they're working toward publication as like 11th and 12th graders. And that's such a cool thing to have on your resume. I would have like probably literally killed somebody for that. And then we have these workshops that are going to be one or two days, depending on what we do. And we've got four of them lined up. We've got a college essay writing workshop, which while, you know, probably a little bit more nuts and bolts, we've got some really fantastic instructors that are going to make it kind of quirky and fun. College essay writing. And as as I understand it, that's more and more of a challenge for younger students, specifically now is writing. Yeah. And I don't know if it has to do with nobody's literally writing with their pen anymore. Or it's totally. all on computer. But it seems like, you know, is creative writing taught as much anymore in the early grades? Are you hearing that that that's just being dropped? No. I mean, we're lucky in our school district that that I think because part of what National Writer Series has done is really get kids interested and engaged in that. And mm-hmm. so we have that in our area. But it's definitely, I mean, it's an arts type of thing. So right. it can get cut when you've got budget cuts. But writing a college essay is a very specific it skill. It is, yes. And, you know, they have got they have certain questions that you have to answer. And then they give you these crazy, weird, open-ended ones that, right. you know, if, you, if you've never practiced that type of writing, if you've only done, like, I write an essay that's a book report and I write an essay that's a analysis of this. If you've never written, like, creatively about yourself, that's hard to do. Right, right. And to feel that you have, like, the voice to do that and whatever your experience is to, like, make that interesting to another person, that's hard. And so I think that class, you know, is is very informative, but also builds a confidence in an ability to write like that. And what age ranges usually attend that a class like that? That's usually 11th and 12th graders because wow. it's it's top of mind for them. I think everybody else is like, that's far away. I don't have to worry about that just yet. I think it's exceptional that you focus on, you know, these distinct age groups because yeah. that 11 to 18... I think sometimes it gets a little lost sometimes. You oh, know? yeah. And the fact that you literally and intentionally try to craft programs that help them mm-hmm. and help them along. And you, throughout your career, have been a freelance writer. Yeah. And what's interesting is that when you think about writing, people maybe just think about novels. They just think about screenplays. But that is a world as well. Oh, yeah. Um, in, in a class that you teach, correct? Yeah. Well, and, you know, I, I got to even give credit to my husband who, uh, when we graduated from college, uh, he took a job for two weeks and was like, I hate working in office. This is terrible. I'm done. I'm going to be a freelancer. <laughs> and like, we're living in Naperville, Illinois. We have no money. I'm working in publishing and he's going to be a freelancer. Like, how is this going to work? <laughs> and he has cobbled together the most fantastic set of strange. He's written soccer blogs. He played soccer like one season in kindergarten. 
He has written for like fishing magazines. He's never been fishing. He like he can just figure it out, and it's are fantastic. you outing him on this podcast? Yes, Craig Manning uh, talking about you. <laughs> but no, he's he's amazing, and now he's a journalist and has has built this whole career off of that. But that's like what freelance writing, especially in this day and age. I mean, post COVID, you know, when the world is still, you know, who's working from where and what are we doing and how are we telling stories and what's journalism look like? That's such an amazing skill to be able to translate to so right. many different jobs. Yeah. And that's, you know, having a broad scope and a base of how to write. Yeah. But to be able to navigate different topics and make them exciting to that audience. Exactly. Yeah. So that is a pretty rarefied skill. Yeah. And you just mentioned your husband, Craig's a writer, and you teach classes together on behalf yeah. of National Writer Series, which is great. And I, I like the idea of the class that you teach crafting and pitching a magazine story. Yeah, yeah. Which, again, a very specific skill that is helpful to somebody. And how are these classes received? Do you, do you get feedback afterwards? Do you get success stories ever? Oh, yeah. Well, and what's cool is we get to work one-on-one -on -one with the kids. And they come in. Sometimes these are kids that are signed up by their parents, honestly. Sometimes <laughs> it's kids that are so excited and all they want to do is write. And by the end, everybody is excited and they want to write. And I have one little success story from our uh, children's book class that we did. We had this this girl who was was very quiet, was paying great attention and, and engaged, you could tell, but was very quiet. And I was like, I don't really know what kind of story we're going to get back from her. And she wrote back. It was a, a beautiful story that was about, you know, two sisters and this, this special quilt that they share and this like family moment. I, I tell you guys, it could it should be published like professionally and be a New York Times bestselling book. And it was, I cried the first time I read it. I was like, this is amazing. This girl who I was, I was hoping I was engaging her and I just couldn't tell came back with truly one of the best pieces of writing I've ever seen. And I was an acquisitions editor. And so I, we published it in our, our journal. I was like, can I, can I introduce you to some people? She's like 15 years old, you know, oh I, gosh. you know, too soon to probably start on that journey, but I'm like, please keep writing. Right. And that's what I hope anybody gets from any of these It's just, please keep writing. Right. Even if you do it just for yourself. Just that expression and that that habit is so powerful and and gives credence to who you are and what you have right. to say. And that's I, I know that that's a mantra in this space. Mm -hmm. Just keep writing. And sometimes when you suffer from writer's block or you feel like you're getting more no's than yeses, mm -hmm. you just have to keep going. Yeah. Just yeah. putting the next word on the paper yeah. helps in the journey. So what's it? like at home for two writers do you guys have write-offs <laughs> do you compare each other's stuff we do, do your families we try to see who can type the fastest because whoever <laughs> can make the most words by the end of the day has has won the day uh no i mean it's funny because you know my i have a, an orthodontist mom my dad's an mba and so then i'm like i'm gonna be an english major and they're like excuse me like <laughs> what at u of m you're gonna go be an english major and my husband was actually a vocal performance major uh at western and I said, what if you got like a backup degree? Just in case, just in case. Like, you know. That's a gentle bit of uh, I know. Yes, Jillian, the, the type A. And so he was like, well, I, I like writing. And so he got an English major. And now, I mean, luckily we have, uh, I think, bucked all the stereotypes and made livings off of what we're doing. But yes, it's it's usually a pretty quiet household. There's just a lot of clickety clackety um, all day <laughs> long. And then we'll take breaks. And there'll be times he'll see me kind of like staring off into the distance like this. And he's like, do you need help with a word? And I'm like, yes, I do. And then we will like, play the which word are you trying to pick out of oh, your brain lovely. game and and then we read each other's work and give each other notes i was and, gonna ask about that yeah. because i can see that being maybe a possibly contentious thing oh yeah no i'm competitive craig is so criticism nice isn't yeah taken right no like, yeah <laughs> that's your opinion i'm the writer right no no that's it's good that we don't have two of me having one a, a craig <laughs> and a me works out fine but wow. yes yes he's Self -realization. a gem realization yes. this is beautiful <laughs> well we mentioned the firekeeper's daughter and not to shamelessly plug our podcast but we did have vangeline bully the author on you our did? podcast um did you guys keep your cool i yeah, I think so. Yeah. All right. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. you did better than me. <laughs> yeah. I have no chill. Community <laughs> member. It yeah. was, yeah, it was a, a little shorter term thing. And yeah. Mark called me a day before and I was like, you got to be kidding me. This is great. So yeah. I had a little bit of time to prepare, but she mentioned she was coming back for the National Writers oh, Series in did. December. Yeah. Yep. December 9th. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Wow. She's, she's just amazing. And you guys know her story. I mean- to write your first book like that and yeah. have it take off the way that it did and change people's entire perceptions and worlds and oh yeah and she's just she's so lovely and so gracious and when when you're that successful sometimes I've I've seen authors go in the yeah. other direction and she just 
seems to give and give and wants to, she wants to do classes while she's here and connect yeah. with our community. And I, I am just in awe of her. And as a Native American author, I think it's very important. I'm so glad the book got picked up for a series on Netflix mm-hmm. through the Obama's yeah. production company. But that, she's not the first Native off, author you've had. I mean, you have had several, yeah. which I think is, is really Braiding important. Braiding Sweetgrass yeah, yeah. recently. Yeah, yeah. Robin Wall Kimmer, yeah. And that's, I mean, now that, you know, I, I'm in this role because I worked for Grand Travers Resort and Spa. So I was working, you know, sort of under the tribe. And what I realized is I grew up here and I knew nothing. And I remain ashamed and embarrassed by that. And I read, you know, The Eagle Returns. That was like my first introduction to understanding. Yeah, Mm -hmm. yeah. Like what was going on in this community that I've lived in my whole life where I thought I was a, you know, somebody that knew Traverse City. Yeah. And so my hope is that every season we can bring in and some, whether, you know, it's somebody that's actually from our, you know, our community here, somebody that's Greater Lakes area type of space, somebody that can help real make other people realize what I realized that we, we are not living on what is Traverse City. This is not our land. This is a place, yeah, you guys know. But yes, yeah, we've been a lucky. A place we're lucky to be. Yeah, Very exactly. Lucky to be. Yes. And that element of our area, I think, is special. And when people mm-hmm. from the outside hear the stories and, and to know that she has a tie to this area, and then you have somebody who really made good and is going to you know, really be in the stratosphere soon. Yeah. But the humility was that. I mean, I, I was a little nervous going in because of her, you know, what she's yeah. achieved, but. She put you at ease immediately. So uh, really excited that uh, Angeline Bully is coming back to the yes. National Writers Series in December. Yes. And I mentioned in December. She's yes. like, I know what it's like. <laughs> and <laughs> Yeah, she's had it. She's yeah up in the Sioux. It's much worse. Right. So yeah, this will be like spring break. <laughs> and what's, you know, in knowing you, Jillian, I'm just going to say, when I saw that you got this role, I could, I'm thinking this is just tailor-made for Jillian. Because Jillian's an author her, yourself. So you really know what it takes and you know what it's taken to, to do. But- is it true that you wrote picture books for Sesame Street and have a, quote, encyclopedic knowledge of all things Elmo? <laughs> uh, yes, I have uh, five books with Sesame Street. And my favorite Elmo, whether or not this is entirely canon, I'm not sure, but <laughs> I, I did learn it at one point, is that Elmo's favorite food is wasabi. And that's why Elmo has no eyelids. What? <laughs> Dude, when, when Caden was a toddler, um, he had an Elmo phone. Oh, gosh. And I like mastered that voice and we used to drive around like when I would drive him around <laughs> to put him to sleep and I'd have Elmo call him and I'd talk to him and then we would have Elmo call other people's kids oh and gosh. I've been Elmo several times. You must have been very popular. I, I, I loved it. And then uh, I've since lost it and a lot of kids don't know Elmo that much anymore. But the parents think it's hilarious when I make Elmo say whatever I want. Oh, yeah. Say, Elmo you know? can, yeah, all but, kinds of stuff that Elmo might <laughs> I'm not, not say. I'm going to spare it on this podcast I'm, here. But. I'm stuck on the <laughs> rather horrific detail of the fact that he's had so much wasabi, his eyelids have burned off. off. <laughs> right? Again, not wow. sure if that's canon. Uh, I can tell you Elmo's always three and a half years old. He has birthdays. <laughs> On his half birthday, apparently. Never gets any older. Right. Uh, he can't take things out of the oven. Only, I think, Bert and Big Bird can do that. Maybe Oscar. Oscar might be old enough. Um, this is unbelievable. And yeah, Elmo does not say, he always says, instead of I or me, he says yeah. Elmo. Third, play, third yeah. person. And Cookie Monster always says me. And Cookie Monster, like shout out to Cookie Monster. He's my favorite because he's got the right priorities in life. Um, <laughs> but, and there's this thing, you guys should check this out. It's uh, Crumbly Productions, I think, or Crumbly Pictures. It's Cookie Monster spoofing like all kinds of different movies, like Lord of the Rings is Lord of the Crumbs. And they're like these, like, I don't know, five, seven minute long episodes. They're hysterical. So uh, I think there's a Karate Kid one. Um, yes. Yeah. So a this is what, kid. after you're done with this, uh, that's what you do next. This is, <laughs> you have just solidified my evening. Is there anything else uh, you'd like to share with our listeners about what you are doing, what's coming up, anything exciting you'd like to share? Yeah. I mean, I think the thing that I've, I've gotten so much joy and excitement out of lately is we've started bringing on um, what we're calling community partners. So we've always had sponsors because we need to be able to rent the opera house and do our events and everything. But our community partners are these these free partners, usually nonprofits or organizations in the community where there's a tie to the book. And so we bring them in and we, we cross promote with them and we work with them to do special events. So we have a woman named Pam Houston who's coming in the fall and we're working with uh, the Traverse Bay Community or Traverse Bay Children's Advocacy Center and Grass River Natural Area. And we're teaming up and doing a hike for healing. And then they're going to come you know, to our event and we're going to talk about what they do and all kinds of different things. But it's amazing 
I mean, I think there's some statistic of northern Michigan having something like 300 nonprofits. I don't know what exactly the number is, but it's it's a lot. And so to find the ways that we can connect people with those projects and those amazing things that are happening and then back to books. And it just I'm making these like little star connections. I feel like everywhere I go and creating this constellation of awesome people doing awesome things in Traverse City and bringing it back and pushing it new places. And I could do that all day. I could. I could hire somebody else to do all of this stuff, which I would be, I'd be sad and jealous, but like to just be able to connect with people like that and to find people that are just so excited to be passionate about what Traverse City is about and what our community can be and how we can lift each other up is amazing. Wow. I told you, I walk out of every, every podcast (laughs) taping, just feeling great. Um, How can our listeners support National Writers Series? How can they donate? Yeah. So uh, nationalwritersseries.org is the website. And we actually do some really cool memberships, too. And so you can get, like, 10% off at Morsels. We could do, at certain membership levels, free tickets. And you get early access to buying tickets, all kinds of fun stuff. So there's there's some good, happy stuff in there, too. But, yeah, I mean, and we love when people want to support the Raising Writers, too. I mean, that's big. And even if that's volunteering, you know, just having people that are excited to help us connect with kids and give them the skills and the joy of reading and writing. Amazing. Jillian, thank you so much for your pursuits and for all of those who pursue along with you bringing amazing authors and literary experiences to our community and for including and educating our children and youth. And to our listeners, thank you all for listening and for pursuing the positive. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us again at the Pursuit of Podcast, the Pursuit of National Writers Series. Thank you so much, Jillian Manning, for coming in. And to learn more or to get involved with NWS, go to nationalwriterseries.org. Also want to give a continuing big shout out to our supporters at the Tin Lid Hat Company, tinlidco.com. Use promo code The Pursuit of for discounts to our listeners and for all audiovisual uh, podcasting production inquiries reach out to us at newleonard.com <laughs>